Well, hey, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Glad to have you joining us today online. It has been a little while since I've been able to be here with you online. Uh, And if this is your first time seeing me, my name is Chip. I'm the lead pastor here at The Orchard. And I'm excited today to take just a few minutes to walk with you through what I think is maybe one of the most interesting passages of Scripture inside the New Testament. It's just honestly not something that you would expect to find in the Bible, and yet it's right here. So we're going to look at that today, and and looking at this very interesting passage, I do think that there's some pretty important implications that we can draw from it uh, about how we uh, swim in the stream of Christianity that we find ourselves in uh, as a believer or as somebody who has just grown up in the southern culture. So uh, for today, what I'd invite you to do is take your Bible and join me in Acts chapter 19. So in Acts chapter 19, uh, let me give you a little bit of context as you turn there, um, because we're pretty advanced inside the book of Acts, right? When you look at the book of Acts, maybe a good way to just kind of overview the entire book is pretty simple. Uh, In Acts uh, chapter 1, we see Jesus go up. Uh, We see uh, a little bit later in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit come down, and then we see the church go out. So that's kind of the formula, right? Jesus ascends to heaven, goes up, the Holy Spirit comes down and indwells the church, and then the church goes out and takes the gospel of Jesus to the known world. And that just kind of progresses throughout the book of Acts. One of the big characters in the book of Acts is a guy named Saul, who after he is converted is named Paul, and he becomes the quote-unquote apostle to the Gentiles, where he takes the gospel to places that the gospel had not been proclaimed before. Paul's the author of most of our New Testament and is probably, outside of Jesus, the most influential figure inside of modern-day Christianity. Paul, as a missionary to the Gentiles, takes several mission trips that we see inside the book of Acts. And by the time we come to Acts chapter 19, Paul is on his third missionary journey. And in the first two trips, Paul is taking the gospel to new places. He is leading people to faith. He is planting churches and establishing local churches and cities. But by this third trip, he's really going back and revisiting a lot of places that he had already been on his second trip. He's going back to churches that he had planted, back to people that he had led to faith. And yes, there was still evangelism, but now it seems that Paul is focused mainly on discipleship on growing these new believers in these new churches, in these new places. And what's really interesting is that Paul kind of slows down some on this journey. In fact, in his third missionary journey, Paul comes to the Asian city of Ephesus. It was a massive city. It was, for that time, a metropolitan city. People from all over that part of the world would come for trade and commerce to this city of Ephesus. And Paul comes to Ephesus, where he had previously planted a church, and he stays. This was pretty uncommon for Paul, but he stays in Ephesus for probably two years or a little bit more. And we read in Acts chapter 19 some really interesting stuff that happens in Ephesus, and specifically the passage of Scripture that I told you about that in my mind is one of the most interesting in the New Testament happens in Acts chapter 19, verse 11. So if you got your Bibles, let's let's read this together. Maybe you've read it before, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, you're going to be shocked that this story is in Scripture. It's pretty fascinating. Acts chapter 19, verse 11, we read this. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. And when this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. So, Just one paragraph that I find absolutely astounding that's in Scripture because we read of an exorcism gone wrong. 
And, and we'll get there, but let's just kind of walk through this together because I think there's some pretty incredible moments that we can learn from inside of this one paragraph that are that are really relevant to us. So, so what we're going to do is we're just going to start in verse 11, kind of walk through what we just read, understanding it, explaining it, and then at the end I just want to draw a, a kind of a broad application that I think is really important for us. So let's go back to the beginning and kind of walk through it a little bit more closely, looking at it a little more carefully, starting in verse 11. It says that God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. It says, so that even face cloths and aprons that touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them, the evil spirits were cast out of them. Now, I think it's important that we, we notice that phrase. It's a, it's a fairly unusual phrase in verse 11 that says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. Uh, I think by definition, most miracles are extraordinary, right? What makes them a miracle is that they are out of the ordinary. But maybe a better way to translate that word extraordinary is unusual, These were unusual miracles. These were miracles that, you know, were not normally seen. If any miracle was normally seen, it wasn't these. Well, what was the miracle? It's that people would take, it says here, uh, face cloths or aprons that Paul had used and gave them to others and they were healed or had demons driven out of them. And, you know, it's crazy to me, number one, that this says it's an unusual miracle. And yet today there are televangelists on TV who for a love offering or a seed of faith that you send, $99.99, they will send you an apron or a napkin that they have touched and prayed over that will heal you. No, no, that's not the point. This is unusual. And these weren't special napkins or aprons or whatever that Paul was using. If you remember that Paul, yes, he was an evangelist, yes, he was a missionary, but Paul was also a tent maker. He, he made tents to help earn his living and support his ministry. And so most likely what people were gathering from Paul wasn't stuff Paul was praying over and sending out. It was, it was his sweat rags that he had wiped his face with in the heat of the day. It was pieces of the tent that he had cut off that they were taking away. This was not a pattern for people to follow. This was something that God was doing in a new and unusual way. Matter of fact, verse 11 says it very clearly that God was performing these miracles. And I think it's important for us to kind of understand that point as we jump into this section of scripture, that these miracles were not formulas to be repeated. God, listen to me, I believe God does, that he can and he does, still perform miracles today. And yet it is important that we realize he is the one that performs these miracles. It wasn't Paul performing the miracles. Paul might have been the vessel, but God was performing the miracles. And so I don't believe that anybody alive today has just miracles on tap that they can access whenever they want and call upon whenever they want God did this new thing in a new way. It was an unusual miracle where it would heal and also drive out evil spirits. And I think that's the second thing that we might want to notice is in this story of this exorcism gone wrong, there is a very real presence of the demonic. And at the orchard, we talked about that here not too long ago. We did a sermon series. It's still online. You can go look and see. It's called Life is a Battlefield, Battlefield, where we talked about the reality of an enemy that we all face that is the culture of the world, the sin in our flesh, and the devil and demons. That demons are real. There are fallen angels who have rebelled against God. And we don't want to forget that this is reality. Again, it may not be common, but it is real. We have a real enemy that is actively working against the kingdom of God. So what we read here is that these uncommon miracles from God that were being used through these sweat cloths from Paul to heal people and drive out demons, they drew attention. Right, People realized, oh, this is a big deal, and obviously it's a big deal. Obviously it would draw attention, but with that attention came some copycats. It says that there were itinerant Jewish exorcists 
that also attempted, this is verse 13, to pronounce the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So, so what you got to understand is, is that Jewish exorcism was a pretty thriving business back in its day. It was something that was built around following formulas and rituals and incantations that if they said and did the right things in the right way, that they would claim authority over the evil spirits and be able to drive them out. Honestly, it sounds like some practices in the church today that I'm not sure are from the Lord, but they, they practice these things, right? And they, they said, well, if this Jesus that Paul is preaching is using sweat rags from Paul to drive out demons, maybe we should start using his name in our exorcisms to drive out demons. And then we're told that there was one particular group of these itinerant Jewish evangelists who called themselves the seven sons of Sceva. Now, Sceva, it mentions here in the text, was a Jewish high priest. And we have fairly reliable historical records that show us that Sceva probably didn't have seven sons. And so these guys who called themselves the seven sons of Sceva were probably not literally his sons. This was their business name. <laughs> they were the seven sons of Sceva. Your number one uh, exorcist in the Jerusalem area or in the Ephesus area, you know. And so what they would do is they began to try to copy what Paul was doing. And what it says that they would say in their incantations is, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches, come out of her, or, or whatever. And so they would go around and do this. Well, they, they go around and they do this and they try this, and we don't know if they've done it before or if this was the very first time. But in this instance here in Acts chapter 19, something pretty incredible happens. They go to this man who is possessed by a demon and they say, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. And the demon answers, right? Like the, the demon responds. And this is what the demon says. The demon says, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who the heck are you? Could you imagine the fear that enveloped these guys in that moment. To hear the demon speak from this man and say, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you. Now, e even that phrase, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? That, that's pretty an interesting phrase, right? Because in the English translation, the word know is kind of the same. And in the Greek that the Acts was written in, those are two different words. Well, I know Jesus and I know Paul. So the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible that I'm reading out of, translates one, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul. So really there's two types of knowledge going on here. The, the word for I know Jesus speaks of the demon saying, I have an experiential knowledge of Jesus. Like, I know the reality of Jesus. James tells us, he says, hey, you might believe that God's one. Well, good for you. The demons believe that God is one, and they tremble. The demons are well aware of who Jesus is, of the power that he holds, of his authority as the Son of God who is coming one day to right every wrong and set up his kingdom to rule and to reign on this earth. They experientially know Jesus and then they say, I know, or the CSB says, I recognize Paul. That word there is not an experiential knowledge. It is more of an information recognition. Like, I've heard about Paul. I'm aware of who Paul is. I've never met Paul, never seen Paul, but I've heard of him. And so the demon says, look, I, I, I've, I've seen Jesus, and I've heard about Paul, but who the heck are you? And so in, in that moment the demon just reacts. And, and before we get to the demon's reaction, which is hilarious, let's just stop for a minute. Think about this. The demon says, I know Jesus. I've heard about Paul. What would it be like if we were so influential in God's kingdom, if we lived our lives in such a way that we impacted lostness so significantly that the demons heard about our name, that the demons recognized our name as someone who is being used of God. I don't know. I think that's, that's interesting. Um, but the, the demon recognizes, I know Jesus. I know Paul. I don't know who you are. And the demons hop on the man. This is actually what the text says. It says, then the man with the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them. Look at this. 
so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. Look, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight before. You may have been in a fight. You may have gotten your tail whipped. But have you ever been beat so bad that you had to run away naked and bleeding? Naked and wounded? Like this demon dogged walked these seven itinerant Jewish exorcists, overpowered them, beat them down, made them run out with their tail between the legs. Why? Because these seven sons of Sceva, they tried to copy the formula, but they couldn't copy the power. They were overpowered. They were beaten down. They ran out the door naked and wounded. Why is that? Because the seven sons of Sceva were not seeking after God. They were just seeking after what God could do for them. He was a means that they might exercise more demons so that they may gain more money and more influence and more prestige. They weren't seeking God. They were just seeking what God could do for them. How dangerous that is for every single one of us. That we have that same temptation not to seek God for God's sake, but to seek God because of what we want him to do for us. And this is where I, I kind of want to start drawing in some of these implications. Um, you see, in our part of the world, right here where I'm speaking today is Lake City, Florida, and this deep south, I think that North Florida is as southern as you can get without going back north again. Once you get out of North Florida, you just might as well be going back up north, right? In this part of the world, it's incredibly easy to know the language of Christianity and to know the culture of Christianity without ever knowing the Christ of Christianity. We know the lingo, we know the habits, we know how to swim in that stream but we don't know Jesus. We're often guilty of the same faults of these seven sons of Sceva. We try to go through the motions without having any of the substance. We try to copy the form without knowing the function. And I think that that's a huge danger. Um, number one, it's, it's a danger for the local church, right? Right? How many times are we in local churches guilty of seeing something that God's doing somewhere else, some unusual thing, and then trying to copy that thing? Well, if we do that thing the way they're doing that thing, then maybe we'll see the same results they see it. We want to copy what we see in other places, hoping that in our place it'll produce the same results. But there's a problem in that. What happens is that often churches are guilty of exalting the methods over the God who uses those methods. I think that's something that we have to be very, very careful of. That God desires to do new and fresh things for us and in us and through us. We talked about this in our last series at the Red Sea, that God wants to do new things for his people in new ways. And when we just try to copy the unusual means that God has used in another place in our church, we often just get a show and we miss the substance. But I don't just think there's a danger for the individual I think there's a danger, or a danger for the church. I think there's also a danger for the individual. You see, I think oftentimes in our lives, we try to invoke the Jesus that our pastor preaches or the Jesus that my grandma talks about in order to get whatever we perceive as the benefits that come from that. Uh, an eternity in heaven, an escape from hell, hell uh, that God would bless us and our family and jobs, that he would keep us healthy and wealthy. So we invoke this Jesus that our pastor talks about, this Jesus that grandma talks about, hoping that we get the benefits we think he provides, but we never make sure that there's actually a real and personal relationship with that Jesus. That we just want what he can do for us we don't want him. And this is easy to do. So easy to do. We may even be doing it without realizing that we're doing it because in this deep south in which we all live, there is a very defined Christian culture. I mean, you, you know it. You live in it. There, there are phrases we use in church that we use nowhere else. How many times have you used the word fellowship 
outside of a church setting. Or we talk about the good Lord upstairs. We don't even know what that means. But it's a language that we've heard. It's a culture that we're steeped in. It's so defined and embedded in the South that it is possible for us to become so fluent in this culture, its language, its habits, its rituals, its own incantations, that we get the culture without ever experiencing Jesus. And so I want to challenge you today to look at your own heart and to look at your own life and say, If Jesus was missing, would you miss him? Or are you just so enveloped in the culture of Christianity in the South that it's more about the style than the substance? It's more about the form than the function. In truth, you're just copying what you see other people doing in your life. And the reason that your faith is not really impactful in your life is because it's just a poor reflection of what you've seen from others. So I want to challenge you today to take a good hard look in the mirror and ask yourself, do I want Jesus or do I just want the benefits I think Jesus brings me? Do I know Jesus or do I just know how to talk about Jesus? Because I think as we see in this incredible passage in Acts chapter 16, there's a massive difference. Well, if you'd like somebody to walk through that with you or to talk about that with you, we are here, we're available. There's somebody actually right now, if you're watching this live on Sunday morning, that you can talk to through Facebook or our website. Just reach out, let us know, because we would love to wrestle this down with you. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for the time that you've given us today. I pray that it has been helpful. I pray that you would show us the places in our lives where we are just using words and habits and practices that have become devoid of a personal relationship with Jesus. God, will you show us where we've just become copycats? And would you drive us toward, push us toward a true, real, and authentic relationship with Jesus? It's in his name that we pray. Amen.